faced a decision that required you to leave behind a secure and comfortable lifestyle. Well, the scriptures contain remarkable stories that help us picture individuals who had to make decisions just like that and who stood out as a result of their faith in God. Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg continues a study in Hebrews chapter 11 as we focus our attention on Jacob and Moses. Look at the next picture quickly, Jacob and his grandsons. You can see this in Genesis 48. He has the boys on his knees, and then he takes the boys off his knees, and then they bow down before him. It is a wonderful scene. He's now an old man. But if you could paint this picture, you would paint this old man, wouldn't you? And somebody would say to you, now, make sure you get his staff in there. Make sure you get that thing that he's always carrying around with him. Because he he had it with him in Genesis 32 when he crossed the Jordan. And make sure you get something of the picture of his blessing, as it were, graphically descending upon these his grandsons. What a wonderful blessing to be a grandpa that can bless his grandchildren. What a wonderful privilege to have had such a grandfather. Some of you are children here this morning, and you go to grandpa's house, and you make memories— And if in the grace and providence of God there are memories like this in your environment, then you will one day be thankful, even if today you wonder. We've got to keep moving. Next portrait, we stop and look at Joseph and his bones. Joseph and his bones. By faith, Joseph, verse 22, when his end was near. You can read of this in Genesis chapter 50. Joseph spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. Why does he mention this? Well, he mentions this because it's within his purpose. The people of God were buffeted. They were getting ever smaller in number, it would seem. They were saying to themselves, I wonder if there is a future. And so he says, listen, there's a future. Abram says there is. Isaac says there is. Jacob says there is. And there is a future as well. Joseph says so. Because those people were trapped. Those people could see no way ahead. And Joseph said, God will take you up And when he takes you up, make sure you take me up. So don't put me in a very elaborate tomb here in Egypt, which I could obviously have, but just keep my bones in the box. So in years to come, the people would ask, why are the bones in the box? And they said, the bones are in the box because we're going to the promised land. And Joseph wanted us to be reminded of that. And he reckoned that by his faith, he would speak in this way. And you perhaps recall our studies then when we talked about preparing for death. Let's pause for a moment before this, these five pictures of Moses, which begin in verse 23. First of all, we have Moses in a basket. That's the first picture. If you read the record in Exodus 2, it's clear that the basket closed. So it wasn't an open basket where he was lying looking up at the stars, but it was a closed basket because it says that they opened the basket and saw Actually, you could do a picture, not of Moses in a basket, but of Moses in a cupboard, because when you read in Exodus 2, it says that his mom and dad uh, sequestered him away and kept him out of sight, hidden for three months. And when they could no longer hide him for three months, then they put him in a basket and put him down by the bulrushes. It's a great story. If you haven't read it for a while, I haven't read it. I have it in my mind from Sunday school, but I reread it, and I, I was just walking up and down. I was so jazzed by it. Such an amazing story. If you think about it, the king says a need establishes an edict. Drown all the Hebrew boys, keep the Hebrew girls. So they have a baby that is Amram, Amram and uh, Jacobed. Unfortunate names, but nevertheless, these, this uh, Mr. and Mrs. have a baby, and they look on this boy, and there's just a stamp of something on him. And so the edict says, you've got to kill him, drown him. They said, forget that. We're going we're gonna to keep him, and we'll keep him and hide him. And so they hide him, and for three months they managed to keep him in the house. Then they put him in the basket, put him in the bulrushes, send his big sister to kind of stand around the bulrushes while Moses is in the basket. She's standing around the bulrushes. Down comes this big entourage out of the Egyptian headquarters, and suddenly she's in the company of Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter pokes her nose around, opens the basket, finds the boy, says, oh, I'd like to take him home with me. Quick as a flash, the big sister says, hey, how about this? How about I get a Hebrew woman to nurse him? Oh, says Pharaoh's daughter, that's a splendid idea. So she runs home, gets Moses' literal mother to be his nursemaid. 
She looks after him, weans him, gets him to the position where he needs to be. Then he goes into the custody of Pharaoh's daughter. God is so good, isn't he? He takes care of all the details. Baskets and cupboards and bulrushes and mothers and sisters and stepbrothers and all of these things under his control. Don't be lying awake in your bed worrying about everything. Don't be tossing and turning, trying to replay the video of the last 12 months, the last 12 years, the next six months, whatever it might be. Oh, what will I do? And where will I go? And what will happen since this? Listen, relax. Lie on the floor and rest in the fact that your Father knows best. He moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. The deceit of Jacob, Jacob's own deceit, is in the unfolding plan. The strange experience in the bulrushes is part of his purpose. That's the first little picture that we have, and it is a picture of not Moses' faith, but the faith of his mom and dad. And it is a reminder in passing how important it is for us as young families to establish the parameters for our kids in such a way that they grow up with this kind of history. You just bump one picture down and you find another one of Moses. Now all these years have passed. Now he's about 40 years old. You say, my, he looks handsome there, does he not? Because this is Moses in a midlife decision. We could say a midlife crisis, but that's just cute. It's a midlife decision. Verse 24, when he'd grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What's that all about? Well, it was an act of faith. What was the act of faith? The act of faith was this that here now in, in Pharaoh's establishment, he had everything that represented security to him. Outside of the precincts of Pharaoh's establishment, there was nothing that represented security. There was only obscurity. There was only emptiness. There was only impoverishment. There was only slavery. What would encourage a young man to make such a crazy decision from an earthly perspective? Why would somebody give up so much to embrace so little? The answer is because he, re he realized that he could not identify himself with the Israelites and also with the Egyptians at one and the same time. It is a fixed principle, loved ones. We cannot be the friends of the world and the friends of God at one and the same time. That's what James says. He heard that from his brother, Jesus. And those of us who are trying to play that middle course know how empty and futile it really is, because we are neither happy as a friend of the world, nor are we happy in the company of God's friends, because we're a walking contradiction. And Moses now, in the maturity of his life, makes a radical decision, the kind of radical decision that some who are here today need to make because your background is relatively similar to Moses. You were nurtured by a mom and dad who loved you and cared for you. They gave you the foundations of faith. They protected you. They provided for you. And for years you have lived buoyant, as it were, on the faith of the surrounding family experience. But now you're your own man. Now you're your own girl. Now you're mature, and you're at that point in your life where you have to determine for yourself what is your choice. Are you going to live as a friend of the world? Or are you going to live as a friend of God? Are you going to live by the world's standards, laugh at the world's jokes, employ the world's methodology? Or are you going to do what is absolutely crazy to your non-Christian friends, and that is take your stand with Jesus Christ? Go absolutely against the flow. Nail your colors to the mast. Say, I don't care who knows, this is my life from this point on. I am thankful for my past, but this is my day, and this is my time, and this is my decision. You see, there are many people who continue to believe that they can have a private faith in Christ, in God, without any public confession that they can come to church as sort of private believers. They have a card, you know. They never show it to anybody. There's no identification. They just privately believe. They never tell anyone. They never profess it. They're unprepared to be baptized. They never make much of it. They never, never verbalize their faith. Let me tell you something. The chances are you're not a Christian. The strongest chance is you do not believe. Because the same Holy Spirit who implants faith within a life implants the boldness to verbalize that faith. 
And when I do not verbalize my commitment and declare my choice and make public my confession, I call in question all of this private stuff that I hold on to in myself. What does Romans 10, 9 say? If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How about your public confession? It's not enough that people simply infer that we are Christians, that we are believers, because to the witness of our lives, there needs to be added the testimony of our lips. When you plant bulbs, if you plant a good bulb, you get nice flowers. You plant a dead bulb, you get nothing. You plant the bulb of faith in the life of an individual, you get a confession of faith. And Moses, when he had grown up, said, here it is. I'm with these guys. Choose you this day whom you will serve said Joshua, but as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Now, the remaining three pictures, we'll just glance at them. Because you have Moses in a basket, you have Moses with a midlife decision, then you have Moses opting for treasure versus pleasure. If you read verses 25 and 26, Egypt offered him social status, physical satisfaction, material gain. He could have reasoned that by remaining in Pharaoh's courts, he would be able to exercise an influence on behalf of the people of God that he would never be able to do if he went and joined himself to them. However, he renounces his privileges of Egyptian citizenship. He identifies with this crummy little group that has no political rights at all. He chooses ill treatment, and he chooses disgrace, we're told, for the sake of Christ. In much the same way that the mighty apostle Paul, who had all the right kind of background, the law degrees, and all the kind of sophisticated pageantry that marked his life, said, and all this stuff, I counted as dung for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. It was like stuff that comes out of a horse that you try and avoid when you go to the, to the parade or the circus. That's pretty graphic. In fact, I can get a little more graphic, but I won't. He doesn't say, it was kind of okay, and I decided just to move it to the side of my plate. He said, I wouldn't even stand in it. I wouldn't even get near it. That's what I viewed it. And that's what this guy does. People who looked at him said, you know what? You got it made. You got a great family background. You got a deal when you went in there with Pharaoh's daughter. Now you got a big chariot, big house, big stuff. And the chances are, you're going to be the head guy in Egypt. Stay there. He said, I can't stay there. Why? Because I can't be a friend of the Egyptians and a friend of the Israelites at the same time. Why? Because the, the Egyptians are, are killing the Israelites. I'm either a slave with my people or I'm an apostate. And what was the problem in, in Hebrews? Apostasy. People who were saying they were one thing and living as, the, as another. He says, I can't say that I am an Israelite and live as an Egyptian. I can't say that I'm a believer and live as an unbeliever, because if I do, then I call in question the profession of faith that I've made. And when you stand and look at that portrait, you understand it. Moses, in verse 27, opts for the invisible rather than the visible. I don't know how I would paint that. But he left Egypt, we're told in verse 27, whether this is a reference to him going into the wilderness in Midian after he killed the Egyptian, or whether it is uh, that the historical thing gets a little ahead of itself here, and this is a reference to the Exodus, is not as significant as the fact is that he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. In other words, he gave up the immediate for the ultimate. He recognized as Paul says, that we set our eyes, 2 Corinthians 4, not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are permanent. That's the hardest lesson for me to learn. That is the hardest thing to learn. Because everything that we see, touch, handle, and know seems to be that which we should have and which makes us significant. And Paul says that is the most insignificant part of it all. It's the stuff you can't see. And all the things that Moses could see, he turned his back on. And finally, in verse 28, we have a picture of Moses standing underneath a blood-stained door. Moses underneath a blood-stained door. I don't have time to go back to Exodus 12 and to recount with you there the story of the Passover. It is a most amazing story. 
Moses is sent to sell, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses responds, you will recall, in the wilderness by saying, I have a brother who's really good at this kind of stuff. God says to him, who made your mouth? Moses said, okay, I have the point. And then he begins to go to Pharaoh. Every time the plague comes, Pharaoh backs off. Every time the plague backs off, Pharaoh changes his mind again. And eventually it comes to the plague of death for the firstborn. And God comes to Moses and he says, this is what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to get a, a lamb without blemish. This will be costly for many families, but I want you to do it. I want you to bear the cost, and I want you to pay attention to the instructions. I want you to kill the lamb. I want you to take the blood and put it in a bowl. I want you to get a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the bowl, take the, take the hyssop, and sprinkle the lintels of the door with blood. Does it sound very plausible? Does it challenge the intellect a little? Does it sound ridiculous? And then when the angel of death comes, we will see which houses have the blood on the doors, and that angel will pass over those homes, and the firstborn will not die. But those who will not put the blood on the doors, the firstborn will die. Now do it, Moses. Moses says, fine, consider it done. And he sets the Passover up. And the angel of death comes and passes over. And God fulfills his word to his servant. Could Moses make sense of the promise? Now, particularly, could he understand the command? Without question. And here we are in anticipation of this evening. And Jesus says, I want to let you know that in this bread that I break and in this cup that I pour, it's to remind you of the way in which by my death I have liberated you from the bondage of your sins. It will remind you of the way my people came out of Israel many years ago, and it will allow you to anticipate the future. And today, people look at the picture and they say, you've got to be crazy. Are you telling me to believe that as a result of the shedding of the blood of the Lamb of God that there is forgiveness for my sin? Surely there's a better way I can do it. Surely I can give some money here or become a faithful servant there, or perhaps I can become diligent and religious or what all these other things. Give me a decent, sensible way, and then I will believe there is no other way. The only way in Egypt was the way of the bloodstained door. And the only way in Cleveland this morning is the way of a blood-stained cross. And it is by faith. By faith. Can I ask you? Just imagine now the continuum of this portrait gallery in Hebrews 11. And God has added to it all down through the corridors of time. Another face here and another face there. Is your, face, is your face in the group? You say, well, I'm sure I didn't get an individual one with a light on the top of it. No, neither did I. That's a dead certainty. But I'll tell you what, I'll settle for finding my face with a magnifying glass in a huge big group. And when I find my face, I will be able to rehearse nothing of that which I brought to the gallery, but only to rehearse all of the grace of the master artist who paints the picture according to his plan. And incidentally, it's not like the church directory which gets obsolete before it's even produced. It's not like the church directory where you look in and say, oh, they're gone. Oh, they, they're gone. Once you get your picture in, it never goes. Why? Because God is faithful. You say, but I made a hash of it. I understand that. God is faithful. I'm a doubting Thomas. I understand that. God is faithful. 
you know what? I've been manipulated by my mother. I've been horrible to my father, and I'm really jealous of my brother. Say, you know what? You could have your picture right up beside Jacob. The two of you are just the same. <laughs> Don't let the devil tell you that you can't get your face in the gallery or once God, by his grace, put your picture on the wall that somehow or another he's going to take it off again. He who began the wonderful portrait of your life will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ because he is a faithful God. It is because of God's faithfulness that we can be permanent members of Christ's family. What an assuring promise from today's message on Truth For Life with Alistair Begg. Please keep listening. Alistair will be right back to close with prayer. In the meantime, just a reminder that if you're benefiting from the messages you hear in this series, you'll want to supplement your study with a book we're recommending. It's written by Nancy Guthrie. It's called God Does His Best Work With Empty. Each chapter explores stories from the Bible that demonstrate how God uses suffering and disappointment and loss to draw people to himself. These stories reveal how God weans us from worldly cravings and replaces them with the hope of the gospel. This isn't a self-help book with a to-do list that tells you how to achieve satisfaction. It is instead a reminder of who God is and what He's done, and it shows how His promises give our lives meaning. Discover how God, through His presence, His grace, and His kindness, redeems us from our emptiness and provides us with purpose and faith and joy. Request your copy of God Does His Best Work with Empty today. We'll send it to you when you donate to support the Bible teaching you hear on this program. Give through the app or give online at truthforlife.org slash donate or call 888-588-7884. You can also mail your donation along with your request for the book. Write to Truth For Life at Post Office Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. And we want to remind you, if you're traveling and unable to listen to your local radio station, you can easily find Truth For Life on the radio when you're on the road. Visit truthforlife.org slash station finder. Type in the zip code you'll be traveling in, and you'll see a list of stations and broadcast times in your area so you can hear Alistair anytime you're away from home. Now, here's Alistair to close with prayer. Father, out of all of these words, I pray that you will encourage those who follow you, that you will pick up the faint-hearted, strengthen the weak knees. I pray for those who uh, are living with the idea of a kind of private faith, secret discipleship, Pray that you will show us that either our discipleship will destroy our secrecy or our secrecy will call in question our discipleship. Some of us need to make choices, decisions about where we stand. Grant us grace to do so. Thank you for the pardon for our sins, for the peace that endures, for your presence that cheers and guides us. Thank you, O God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Joseph, Moses, and our God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Bob Lapine. Thanks for listening. How do you pray when your faith has faltered or failed? Tomorrow, we'll hear how God responded to his people when they began to complain. We hope you can join us tomorrow. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.